Morning, everybody. Morning. <laughs> it's only Tuesday. <laughs> As we begin, I just did want to say that um, I know it's an extremely busy schedule during Chamber Fest, but if any of you would like to chat with me about anything, I'd be so happy to do that. And uh, they have a nice cafe and fairly decent coffee there. So I'd love to chat with you if that would be of any help. So we come back to this same passage that we began yesterday in Daniel chapter 5. Uh, second time this morning to go over the same verses, but some new, new insights, I hope. So let's just read that right away right now, verses 1 to 12 of Daniel chapter 5. Belshazzar, the king, held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, in order that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Then the king's face grew pale, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints went slack, and his knees began knocking together. The king called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, the diviners. The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, any man who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me will be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known the, its interpretation to the king. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. His face grew even paler and his nobles were perplexed. The queen enters. <laughs> the queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. The queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is a spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And king Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now call for Daniel, and he will declare the interpretation. <clears throat> we are giving our attention to Daniel for discipleship today throughout the course of this week. And yesterday, we noted how this passage offers us, I think, a lot in terms of discipleship as calling and the triad of discipleship assessment in terms of character, skill, and supernatural enabling, empowerment. Now, this morning, I first want to suggest that this passage goes on and urges us to deal seriously with the fact that Daniel-like radical discipleship is something that is witnessed to. 
This is something that is too easily overlooked, I think, but it is, in fact, a very serious side of what biblical discipleship is all about. And it is introduced in our passage by the entrance of the queen in verse 10. The queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. The queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. And then the queen proceeds in verse 11 with a four-word phrase that really is hugely theologically significant, though so simply put, there is a man. She is, of course, referencing Daniel himself, only after all the conjurers, Chaldeans, diviners, and the wise men of Babylon in verses 7 to 8 have failed to measure up. But her language, coupled with her description of him, inclusive of that, uh, what we spoke about yesterday, that natural, supernatural mix, cannot help but evoke what the theologians refer to as incarnational theology. That is how God communicates with his world in human form, incarnation. And how does he do that here in the story of Daniel? Through a <laughs> radical disciple who has left a legacy to be remembered and noticed. Through a radical disciple like Daniel Again, I'm urging that our goal is not mediocre discipleship or laissez-faire Christ-following, but radical commitment. But it is precisely because it is incarnational that the queen can provide a witness to it at all which is to say that the impact of, the fruit of, discipleship of this radical type is, for one, observable. Somebody can see it. The queen will have seen a difference in a man named Daniel from an entire generation back. She will have seen something that attests to his extraordinary spirit that she talks about in verse 12. Her best attempt to say there was something supernatural about this man, as well as natural skills and wisdom. Or what she references as a spirit of the holy gods in verse 11. Radical discipleship asks a very penetrating question of you and me. Can people so postured as to witness to your life and mine see a difference? Actually see it. It's observable. It's incarnational. This kind of incarnational description is, for two, also experiential. Such things as the queen remembers about Daniel, such things as insight, interpretation of dreams, the explanation of enigmas, and the application of wisdom can only be verified as they are experienced. And so radical discipleship, again, postures before you a very penetrating question for you, for me. Can people so postured as to witness your life, mine, 
not only see, but even experience something different because of God's claim on your life. And certainly, of course, the Queen's testimony makes it clear that Daniel's contribution an expression of his godly faithfulness was also obviously memorable. Verse 11, she invokes what is remembered of this man Daniel from a previous generation under the rule of a previous king, King Nebuchadnezzar. An entire generation has come and gone And yet she remembers. And so again, in terms of radical discipleship, this passage of the Bible asks me a penetrating question. Can people so postured as to witness my life remember something different about me, about you? Is it observable? Is it experiential? Is it memorable? Incarnation, God speaking through you to your culture, your world. Dear women and men, it would be wholly unfaithful to the text here in Daniel 5 if we fail to take heart that it was none other than a woman, the queen, who has the spiritual sensitivity to bring to mind the incarnational impact of this man named Daniel. It is not incidental that it was a woman In the annals of the Bible, I suggest to you, it is so often the spiritual sensitivities of women that come to the fore. And that I plead that men are meant to learn from and emulate. But, secondly... So we've seen first that this kind of radical discipleship is something witnessed to, something observable, something memorable, something experiential. Secondly, I want to suggest that this passage urges us to embrace Daniel-like radical discipleship in terms of something so material as time. Timing, discipleship in real time, we could call it. Our text first expresses this in the cry of the queen that we have already talked about as of yesterday at the end of verse 12 when she says, Now, now call for Daniel. On the Aramaic Hebrew, as it puts it emphatically here in the original, now, on is the emphatic point of the queen. It is clearly a recognition with regard to time factors which are relevant now, in which someone of Daniel's character. Daniel's skill, Daniel's godliness, supernaturally enabled, is now needed, that is, called for, now call for Daniel. Now means the present, as opposed to a past tense sense of discipling impact that is limited within certain boundaries of past experiences and history, what you used to be before you got a bit jaded, before you lost the passion 
what you used to be. And as opposed to a future tense in the sense of optimistic hopes and dreams that may or may not become reality what you hope to be. But now the queen emphasizes on now in the heat of the moment, in the face of current pressures, in the light of a godly perspective which is required at this moment in time. We need young men and women, and we need counselors and staff and old Chehi tagalongs like me and a few others. <laughs> We need young men and women who can be turned to as God's person in the midst of your current culture, in the fray of your current questions and dilemmas, amidst the maelstorm of ethical, moral, political, social, and spiritual challenges that are the currency of your current experience in the world that is your responsibility in 2019. You're now in your youth and the youthfulness that is you now. However, there is another time frame, another frame of time that is certainly at play in the broader context of Daniel chapter 5. It is critical to our appreciation of what God is saying. In its storied narrative account of what we could not at all be overstating to refer to as a cultural climate in which scorning the sacred was fashionable. This is certainly the essence of what is transpiring in verses 2 to 4, isn't it? as concerns the sanctity of the Jewish worship elements that Belshazzar openly treats with disdain, ridicule, and really scorn. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, in order that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them, then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. sacredness, the sanctity of godly worship is disparaged by the king, no less. That is, in the privileged political position responsible for cultural mandate and formation of people. And those objects which were intended for the honoring of and the praise of the one living and eternal God are given over, says verse 4, to the glorification of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, to objects which bespeak really a distorted trust in human standards, human Values that are largely and invariably determined by money and power and Epicurean pleasure seeking standards of what is worthwhile. They are scorned, in other words, in the preference for an insidious, not so subtle form of idolatry. All through the Bible, we are contending with humans' tendency towards idolatry rather than the worship of the one true eternal God. 
And the point of this in terms of radical discipleship is that this is the time in the very midst of cultural ridicule and scorning of the sacred when a Daniel is called for, a Daniel must be read. However, there is yet one other frame of time consideration that is certainly at play in the broader context of Daniel chapter 5. We come to it, very interesting verse 6, where it's recorded that the king's face grew pale. His thoughts alarmed him. His hip joints went slack, and his knees began knocking together. All Old Testament scholars agree, and it is no doubt true, that the biblical writers in, here intend unmitigated laughter, humor. For it is certainly a funny picture when we envision the pale face of the king and his hip joints buckling and his knees knocking one against the other. And in fact, since the Aramaic original text literally renders it, the knots of his loins were loosed. Some reputable scholars argue that since the loins are sometimes associated with reproductive organs, never clearly translated as hips, it's a polite English version, that the meaning here is that the king was so shocked and he experienced such an alarm that a loosening of his sphincter muscles of his bladder and his anus, that he lost control of his bowels, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> It was not a pretty sight. It was not a pretty smell. The best Hebrew scholars say what this is descriptive of is he lost control. The Bible is material. It doesn't shy away. And of course, paramount to the flow of the story <laughs> is that this is a, the flow. <laughs> I heard the chuckle. <laughs> this talk is gonna reverberate throughout the day, I think. This is a response to what is clearly a supernatural occurrence that we learn later in the passage, which we don't even have time to go to the judgment of God, the relaying the judgment of God, but it's clearly that's what's intended in verse 5, the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. The king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Later in the story we find out what God means by that, the writing is interpreted by Daniel as God's judgment on Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. My friend, Dr. Ian Hepburn at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, one of the better Hebrew Old Testament scholars that I know, says that the language here is in fact idiomatic in the original, so as to convey, quoting my friend Ian, it's to convey humorous confusion leading to experiential fear. King Belshazzar in the narrative order of the biblical text represents a social milieu of confusion, humorous as it may be, whose byproduct is fear. And the point of this in terms of radical discipleship for me, for you, for followers of the same God of Daniel, 
that this is the time. This is the time in the very midst of social confusion producing real experiential fear that I see so rampant across our world. This is the time when a Daniel is called for, when a Daniel must be ready. And then just one last bit in terms of what this account offers us with regard to a discipleship in real time. This is so challenging to me and I hope will be to you even though you're in such youth. That is that the historical chronology brought out in the book of Daniel makes it quite certain that Daniel would have been about 85 years old at this juncture when the queen says, there is a man, call for Daniel. 85 years old. This is casting a vision before us of what we should aim at in terms of lifespan discipleship. If you want to be an ardent disciple of Jesus Christ, look to the end. Where will you be when you're 85? Will they call for you? Lifespan discipleship. Mm -hmm looking to the end of your life as some of us are approaching more closely than others. That is what I aspire to. I do not want to be a grumpy old man. I do not want to be a stale Christian when I'm 85 years old. I want to be so full of passion for God, so faithful. All of these themes of Daniel, faithfulness to God, wisdom, piety, courage, discipline, that at 85 years old, I'm still pursuing that. And in the time now, they call for Daniel. And that is what I witnessed in the founder of this school, Wilmis Chahi. He was 58 years old when he first took me under wing, young rebel. I was the classic missionary rebel kid, going off the deep end in all sorts of trouble. Music was a pathway to God. Wilmus Chahi took me under wing. He was 69 years old when he died, quite young. I forgot that. But he was always learning more. Like a disciple, always learning about music, about the world, mostly about Jesus, an example of lifespan discipleship that is the reason the Chaiki Summer School of Music exists. Summer before he died, I remember Wilmus showing me after camp was over and I was hanging around helping clean up. He showed me books that he was now reading that were about music as healing for mental disorders ranging from depression all the way to bipolar disorders. Wilmus Chey reading about music as healing. Wilmus was not an academic, but he was a disciple, a learner 
always wanting more. My first year at Chase Summer School of Music, I was this young rebel, angry, forced to come to Chase Summer School of Music for a whole month. My parents were determined to straighten me out. And the Lord spoke to me. Later that year, I really met Jesus in a very real way. I came back to Chehi, a very different 18 year old. And like you, almost all of the chapel messages, some had an impact, some didn't. <coughs> very few were actually ever remembered. I know how that goes. But there was one speaker, I don't know his name, he was a gentleman, but he spoke from Daniel chapter 5. And he issued a call. And I'll never forget reverberating through this, the Ark Chapel. Call for Daniel. Call for Daniel. And that grabbed me all those years ago, 18, to be a disciple like Daniel. So I issue to you as the mark of the radical disciple who is called for in the time of now the now of your youth and the youthfulness that is you now. In the time of scorning of the sacred, in the time of social confusion and widespread fear, can we expect a Daniel? from amongst the ardent musicians and ardent Christ followers who make up Chamberfest. Can we expect call for Eric? Call for Jonathan, call for Zach, call for Haley, call for Audrey, call for Wesley. Call for Daniel. Let it be more than merely exemplative history. Let it be you. For this time. Now. Jesus, I thank you for these students. feel like a little bit like Wilma's Chahi <clears throat> moving towards 85 a few years off but getting closer I feel like Uncle Wilma's as I really love these students I love their passion for music I love their developing of skills. I love their commitment to character. But I pray that you would give them supernatural enabling that makes all the difference. Even today in the midst of hard work, the Holy Spirit would come and supernaturally develop not only these students, but as counselors, as staff, as, as faculty. And I pray that now, in this time, a Daniel will be called for. Bless them through this day in the name of Jesus.